Thank you for joining me today. Thank the Seoul Metropolitan Government for inviting me to share my views about the opportunities and challenges of the, financial, the new financial paradigm. So, a couple things. One is I want to apologize for not speaking Korean. Um, I'm committed to working on it. The second thing is um, <clears throat> I want to manage your expectations. I am not a financial expert. I'm actually not a technology expert. What I am and what I have been for the last number of years is a student of innovation and a teacher at times of innovation. And I spent the last four years... Can you, can you uh, get on the monitor, please? I spent the last four years at a, a place called Harvard University. Familiar with Harvard? Um, running something called the Harvard Innovation Lab. This is the building. And the Harvard Innovation Lab is a incubator, for lack of a better term, focused on supporting Harvard students and Harvard alumni startups. So over the course of four years, I probably worked directly or indirectly with over a thousand different startups. And in working with those startups, and several of them, or many of them were fintech, I think I learned some interesting things about this thing called innovation. And that's really what I want to share with you over the next 30 minutes. But the most important thing that I learned, really the only thing that I want you to take away from this talk, is that whatever you are trying to do, whether it's establish your fintech startup, figure out how to innovate your company, figure out how to lead your city in this new world, whatever you are trying to improve, whatever you are trying to innovate, I encourage you to spend less time focused on the technology code and more time focused on the human code. The majority, the cold water or the cold truth I'm going to throw on you right now is that the majority of innovation fails. It fails. And I'm going to try to prove to you in the next 30 minutes that the reason why it fails isn't because of the technology. The reason why it fails is because the technology does not connect to humanity. That the customer, whoever the customer is, is not willing to change their behavior to adopt the technology. And the customer can be a consumer, the customer can be a business, the customer can be a government, all kinds of customers. So the point of this whole talk is that if you want to get better at increasing the chances of innovation success, get better at human. The other observation I had while at Harvard <clears throat> is that there's a, what I call a silent global innovation arms race going on. That of the 160-some countries in the world today, a lot of them are trying really hard to figure out what to do with all this technology and how to grow the health of their economies and their position in the world. And there's something called the Global Innovation Index. How many people are familiar with the Global Innovation Index? Please raise your hand. Okay, so this was created 12 years ago by some consortium of INSEAD and some other organizations. It's now run by Cornell University and some other organizations. Um, it has the Republic of Korea ranked at 12. As of yesterday, I think it moved up to 11. I think that's good. Um, I'm not sure, but I actually don't think that's the point. I think the point to focus on is, are the, indis are the variables that make up this index the right variables? Is this actually an accurate measure of the health of the economy, the health of the country, of any country, and is this the set of measures that you want to plan for and, and implement against? And I'm going to argue the measures are not wrong, but I'm not sure they're completely right. And the way I think about it is, 
there are two fundamental approaches to innovation. Whether it's innovation within the confines of finance or, or broad, more broadly. And the first is what I call synthetic. So this is structural innovation. This is in invested innovation. This is forced innovation. I use the ping pong paddle as an example. We were talking at dinner last night about how startups claim to be more innovative when they put a ping pong table in their lobby or in their conference room or whatever. There's nothing wrong with synthetic innovation. And I, I argue it's, it's the easiest form of innovation. The problem is I don't think synthetic innovation, investing in synthetic innovation, gets you to a sustainable condition. In order to get to a place where the organization, whether it's a country, a city, a company, is actually fundamentally innovative, capable of increasing the chances of innovation success, you've got to do this. You've got to go after organic innovation, which is less focused on structures and more focused on people. People as customers, people as citizens, people as employees, people. And specifically, the behavior of the people. Here's the deal. How many people in this room? 400, roughly? Let's imagine we're a country or a company. And our goal is to be more innovative, right? To go up the rankings, to beat the next guy, to improve the economic health of the organization. The only way we are more innovative is to behave innovatively. Innovation is not a function, it's a behavior. And behaviors are the root capacity of humanity. So if we want the outcome to be more innovative, we ourselves need to be more innovative. The gentleman earlier talked about responsible innovation, I believe. That's a behavior. That's a sensibility. It's not a thing. It's a way of being. And my, my thesis is that successful innovation is tied to certain behaviors, certain ways of being, certain ways of seeing, certain ways of connecting the dots, enabled by an environment otherwise known as a culture, that allows the people, citizens, employees, customers, to realize their ideas. Now, the problem with organic and the problem with a behavior-based approach to innovation, it's hard. It's harder than technology. If a human has two doors, and over here is the door called technology, and over here is the door called human, most people will pick the technology door because it's actually easier to write technology code than it is to decode our own humanity. But again, if you want to win that race, I think you've got to look the truth straight in the face and you've got to begin to look at the behaviors of the country, the company, the city, the whatever. So as a little bit of proof of this, I was in Dubai um, a couple months ago speaking at a conference and the Sheikh of the uh, Sheikh Ali Al Khoury, who's the Director General of the Ministry of the Interior, asked to meet with me. And we'd spent an hour and a half together. And what was interesting about that 90 minutes together, the word technology never came up. Blockchain didn't come up. Bitcoin didn't come up. Artificial intelligence didn't come up. The only thing Sheikh Ali al Khoury wanted to talk to me about was if I could help him create a culture of innovation within the United Arab Emirates. And I looked at him and I said, how many decades do you have? But this is a guy who's spending, they are spending millions and billions of dollars on both synthetic innovation and also understanding that ultimately to win the race, They've got to invest in organic innovation. They've got to invest in changing the behavior of their employees and their citizens to realize a greater outcome for the country. Does this make sense? Anybody? Yeah, sort of. 
So another way to think about this, the nature of man prefers discrete actions, little triangles on the left. This is synthetic. We're going to do things. And there's nothing wrong with doing things. But if you really want to win the, win the race, win the war, win the arms race, you've got to consider the right model, which is an integrated model, where we're not talking about fintech without consideration of healthcare or education. Everything is connected. You know, society is like a human. It's, it's like in the anatomy of a human. Think of the, the, the financial system is the blood. But the blood part of the system only works if the system is getting oxygen and if the system is getting nutrition. And so when we look to move society forward, we have to do it through the lens of a whole holistic system view. You know, design thinking, if you know that term, is ostensibly about whole system thinking. And again, this is, I think, the only way you really create sustainable innovation and ultimately win, win the race. The other observation, I have many observations, half of them are probably wrong, <clears throat> is, is that the central bank in many countries is taking on a whole new role in driving innovation generally, certainly within the financial space, but even beyond that. <clears throat> and it's moving what my view is, and I'm, I'm not an economist, I'm, I'm, you know, as I said, I'm, I'm just a student of innovation. It's moving the function of the central bank from being about money supply, control, regulation, to being more, as, well, that plus being integrators, being motivators, being enablers, uh, being drivers of the innovation agenda. And I use as my example, last November I attended the Singapore FinTech Festival. Uh, some of you have attended that, I assume? It's a largest, I think it's the largest FinTech conference in the world, 40,000 people. And somebody told me earlier today the goal was 50,000 this year. This is an image of Prime Minister Modi from India, that's Satmandu Mohanty, who's the chief fintech officer of the Monetary Authority of Singapore, which is their central bank. Several other um, dignitaries from Singapore. And they're, they're introducing, this happened last November, is that they're introducing something called APICS, which is a, um, basically a sandbox to connect fintechs with financial institutions in the ASEAN network. But my point is, and sharing this little, this little vignette is that the Monetary Authority of Singapore is, is going way beyond, my view, the sort of traditional scope of the central bank to drive the innovation agenda. So, I want to take a step way, 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 way back. A million years. This thing called innovation has been around for a million years. This is not new, right? Ever since we figured out how to manage fire, mankind has been innovating. So what's, what's different? Why is innovation all of a sudden everywhere? Why is that all anybody is talking about? And it's, my view is it's based on this. Moore's law you're probably familiar with is this idea that computing power doubles every year, the cost is cut in half, and it enables all sorts of things, like AI and machine learning. And it ends up with charts like this, where the volume of big innovations is just exploding the last you know, 20, 30, 40 years. It's remarkable. But what's important isn't this. What's important is this, that the effect of this is not about the individual things. It's not about artificial intelligence alone. It's not about Bitcoin alone. It's about the network now has changed everything. And this is, this is like the heady, heady thought for today. Everything has changed. But the most important part is we have changed. And if you want to be successful with innovation, you have to embrace how we, the humans, have changed. And I, I wrote this as an attempt to explain how we have changed the last 15 years, how we communicate, what we value, what we seek, how we work, how we live, what we expect, our physical health, our mental health, everything has changed. 
and has connected everything so that any conversation about one thing is necessarily about many things. The problem with this definition is that it's complicated. So in our innovative desires, we seek to create startups, we seek to invent things, to turn our ideas into reality. We choose to ignore this truth that the human beings that are involved, whether they be humans as customers or humans as employees or humans as citizens, have fundamentally changed. And we ignore that, and in ignoring that, we end up producing things that the humans actually don't want to adopt because it doesn't fit where they are. So my fundamental argument is that the challenge and opportunities of the financial paradigm are actually the challenges and opportunities of the human uh, paradigm. This is about humanity. If you want to be successful with financial innovation, you've got to be locked in to the human truth, how the human condition and human expectations and human realities have changed. And it gets even murkier because the underlying structure of society and how it works has also changed. It went from discrete and layered and controlled to now flat, open, and user-empowered. And the most important part of the statement is that the new model requires every entity within it to be fully distributed, flat, open, and user-empowered. So this means that organizations or entities that are not flat, open, and user-empowered are vulnerable. This means hyper-hierarchical organizations, monolithic organizations, highly controlled organizations, ultimately will be found out. Ultimately, we'll be exposed and ultimately will lose the race, whatever race they're in. And I can argue this may be the hardest part of this whole innovation thing, is how do we as organizations and we as individuals change? Because we come from a world that, that doesn't, isn't flat, open, and user-empowered, but the world today is. So I spent a lot of time thinking about what's changed more specifically, and I, and I think there are probably like hundreds, if not thousands, of changes in the way our society, our economies, uh, our globe works. And I identified five uh, simple ones. They're not the most important ones, but I think they're interesting. The first one, and they're, and they're probably obvious to you, the first one is the de-layering of value chains. Between the user and the supplier, all sorts of layers, middlemen, middle steps have been ripped out of the system, right? Things like Venmo, peer-to-peer, -peer, bang. There's also this dynamic of uh, getting it when you want. So I was in uh, New York recently, walking down the street, and I see this Starbucks, and there's a sign on the door that says, opening soon, the first only mobile Starbucks. So this is a Starbucks where you can't walk in and actually order a cup of coffee. You're, you're basically only going into the Starbucks to pick up what you already ordered. So you got that, you got Amazon Go, no checkout required, you got the drone thing. But what it really points to is this. I think this is like a really fundamental truth that whatever you are trying to innovate, a product, a service, whether it's infrastructure innovation, interface inno innovation, sort of the, the cheat sheet is look for friction. The humans today, consciously or subconsciously, hate friction. Our job, our collective job, is to take friction out of the system, to expedite the delivery of whatever it is the customer, whoever that is, actually seeks. The second shift that is kind of profound is this commingling or melding or merging of business models. So when I went to business school, it was drilled into us that keep your business model pure. If you're a retailer, be a retailer, and only a retailer. Well, this example, which is Amazon, shows you that their business model captured in the flywheel, if you know the flywheel, it's a Jim Collins construct, that their 
their retail e-commerce business model actually spawned a second business model called Amazon Web Services that turned into a $28 billion business last year, but more importantly, generating 90% of the profitability of the whole company. But what's interesting is the two business models are intrinsically linked, and that the combined model generates even greater stickiness in part of the customers they serve and the merchants they serve. And then there's this. So not only are they retail, they're also cloud, and now they're a bank. But it is all rendered in a completely symbiotic way that results in their customers being even more engaged with their brand. The point of this, this is from a book called uh, FinTech Revolution. The point of this long statement is it's all going to it's all going to blow up. Not blow up, it's all going to turn into a cloud. The, the dividing lines between business models and types of businesses are going to get blurred. The consumer today doesn't care. This is what's kind of crazy. In the old days, it was very important to have your categories clearly defined. Today, because no friction, speed is the, is the need, consumers are remarkably open to changing who they interact with, what they interact with, to get whatever it is they want when they want it. The third paradigm, when I grew up, I grew up in a, in a world or an economy that was a product-centric economy enabled by services. And I feel, I don't have data to support this, I feel like that's flipped. I feel like the world of today is a service economy enabled by products. And, and from a price value standpoint, it gets kind of funky. In the United States, it's actually cheaper to buy a 40-inch television than it is to go out to a nice dinner for two. The, 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 the price value has fundamentally changed. The other thing that's changed is consumer expectations in, in terms of engaging with products or services have moved to this thing that I call codes, which is they need to be in control, they want to have options, personalization, customization. They, they don't care about, about keeping things. It's all about use it and lose it. Experience is essential, every stage of the, uh, of the engagement, end to end. And then sustainability in America is increasingly important. Consumers want to know uh, what you're doing, uh, what you're doing for the economy, what you're, or not for the economy, for the uh, environment and, uh, and the world. So the, the change here is that humans are in charge. <laughs> like in the old days, humans weren't in charge. The corporations, the government was in charge, but in today's world, humans are in charge. The fourth shift is this idea of uh, distribution of, of capital. Things like M-Pesa, you know, M-Pesa, 37 million users now, mostly in Africa, but extending to other parts of the world. So this is a fundamental shift from where we were. And then the fifth shift is that the 24-7 cloud access thing is really sort of rendering fundamental parts of society uh, presenting big questions. So the rise of the whole gig economy has really been over the last 10 years and that's interesting, but what's more interesting are the unintended consequences associated with these changes. So one unintended consequence is this question of what is a job? Uh, what is the employer, what is Uber responsible for? Are these contractors or are these employees? What are their rights, what are their responsibilities? It's creating gaps in certain industries, labor gaps. It's creating problems like this. 1.6 million car accidents last year in the United States due to texting while driving. It's creating issues of identification and authentication. And it's also creating this. And this, I think, is the most egregious truth of it all. The technologies that we are rendering have huge positives, but they also have unintended consequences that are negative. So this is true, this is a fact. 25% of college students in America today take medication for either anxiety or depression. 
25%. Another fact, 40% of Americans are obese. Another fact, 25% of Americans are lonely. We have a responsibility as innovators, as technologists, as government officials, as sociologists, I don't care what your role is, we have a responsibility in our innovation efforts to try to get ahead of these unintended consequences because I actually believe they can and do kill us. Okay, so let's get to the fundamental question of how do you win the race if you want to win the race? With that as a backdrop, and the point of that backdrop is this whole thing is changing. Everything is changing. So everything that you knew yesterday may or may not be relevant today. We actually had a conversation at dinner last night about uh, your job. You know, I grew up in a world where um, you worked hard, you applied yourself, and when you got to like 50 or so, you could just ride it out. You could just do it the way you did it before because that's what got you to where you got. And in the new order, no longer relevant, no longer applicable. Everybody, every just like every country has to innovate, every company has to innovate, I think every individual has to innovate. So how do you win the race? <clears throat> I think you have to accept this. Innovating within the finance realm alone without direct links to understanding the humans involved is not going to produce a lot of success. <clears throat> and this is a radical statement. I understand this is a radical statement. The ultimate winners will not be the innovators. But remember, most innovation fails. The ultimate winners will be the humanists. The people, the organizations, the cities, the governments, the whatever, that understand the truth of the human condition, the truth of the human expectation, the truth of the human need, the human want, and design, build things, tools, applications, products, services that meet the human where they are. By the way, I was reading the Korean Jingong Daily, is that what it's called, the local paper? Yeah? yesterday, and there was a bunch of references to Seoul's efforts vis-a-vis uh, -vis smart cities, which was amazing. But throughout the article, there was also references to the humans pushing back on the, on the innovations. That sometimes the innovations didn't fit with where the humans are. So the winners of the innovation race are the ones who understand where the humans are. Tim Cook from Apple said this about a year ago. Pretty good, right? Our responsibility is to infuse the technologies we make with the humanity that makes us. So if you haven't believed anything I've said, believe the data. 75% of startups fail. Eighty-four percent of digital transformations fail. In the last several years, $1.3 trillion was spent on digital transformation by large corporations. A recent study determined that 900 billion of the 1.3 trillion was a waste of money. 95% of corporate innovation fails. This is the big companies with the big money, the big brains, and they can't get it right. And the reason why they can't get it right is because they think innovation is about creating the thing, right? Innovation isn't about creating the thing. Innovation is about getting the human to adopt the thing. And getting the human to adopt the thing is a behavior change. How many of you have apps on your phone that you've downloaded and never used? You weren't willing to change your behavior to gain the benefit of that app because the benefit of the app was not sufficient to override the cost. And that's the fundamental math of this. 
People don't adopt things unless the benefits significantly outweigh the costs. And the costs are not money. The costs are behavioral. And that word adoption is a very big word. It's not buy, it's not consume, it's not lease, it's not subscribe, it's adopt. It is to bring into a relationship. A guy named Henry David Thoreau once said, the cost of something is how much of your life you give it. We have fixed life, we have fixed capacity. And so in order for your innovation to be adopted by whatever market you seek to adopt it, the math has to be really good. The benefits have to significantly outweigh the cost. Anybody familiar with this? Anybody? No? Three or four people? So it's something called the Hi Maslow's Hierarchy of Need. He was a psychologist back in the 50s, and he came up with this very basic view of why people do what they do, how people do what they do, and it's called the hierarchy of need. And the whole point is that the majority of our decision making, our actions on a daily basis, happens, is focused on meeting our physiological needs, needs for shelter, needs for food, needs for water, followed by needs for safety. So when we are exposed to new and different things, our first reaction is fear. Our first reaction. Every human. And so recognize that when you go to present an innovation to anybody, consumer or business, doesn't matter, their stance, their way, the way they're looking at the question of adoption or not adoption is through a lens of fear. And so in order to get them through that fear door, the benefit set has got to be significant. I use quickly uh, Uber as an example. Um, you know, Uber's a $130 billion valuation, and so you say, well, why is it a $130 billion valuation? Uh, uh, is it because it gets people from point A to point B? Yes, and it adheres to the hierarchy completely. It helps me get from here to there. It gives me a sense of control. It's for people like me. It makes me feel better about myself and ultimately enables me to realize my life. Let's go back to that 84%. Why do 84% of digital transformation fails? Study done by CIO Magazine. Five out of the six reasons, I wish you could read this, five out of the six reasons are behavioral. They're not structural, they're not functional, they're behavioral. Let me skip this. Okay. Five things to win the race. First, accept, well, six things. Accept that it's a human paradigm question, it's not solely a financial paradigm question. But, I argue the first thing you have to do is redefine the role of finance. Move it from being a distributor and a, you know, a distributor, a, 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 a regulator, to being a motivator and instigator. Uh, I, again, I use, I use the Monetary Authority of Singapore as a, as a great example. Second point, we talked about this at dinner last night. Take down the walls. Take down the walls of government, take down the walls of corporations. We were talking last night about the walls between industry and education. Take down the walls between fintech and banks, take down the walls. There are still very, we talked last night, tall walls and very thick walls. <laughs> take down the walls. An example of taking down the walls geographically, I spoke at a conference in Kenya in September. It was called the Afro-Asian Fintech F Festival. It was a joint venture between the Central Bank of Kenya and the Central Bank of Singapore. Taking down the walls. And you have to do this. Take down the cultural walls. Many of you work in organizations that are uncomfortable with risk, uncomfortable with change, uncomfortable with doing things differently, uncomfortable with letting go of the past. And the only way you win this innovation race is to move those behaviors from where they are to a new set of behaviors, and that is a cultural question. 
just a quick thing here. Google did a study three or four years ago trying to understand why certain teams within Google were more innovative and more productive and higher performing than other teams. And the number one reason, the number one attribute of innovative teams is psychological safety. They, the individuals, feel safe to challenge convention, to push new ideas, to disagree with their boss, safe to innovate. Point three, I, I really believe this, that in order for people to behave differently, they have to learn new behaviors and they have to learn new skills and new ways of thinking. And societies have a responsibility, not just through the higher education system, but beyond that system, to both motivate and enable adult learning. Because of this, the pace of change is fundamentally faster than man's natural pace, ability to change. So we have a responsibility to help humans, to help citizens move faster. Redefine success. You know, any organization is guided by a set of outcomes. And I have this kind of radical view, not kind of, it is a radical view, that this is not the right outcome. It's, a, it's an important outcome, but it's not exactly the right outcome. And the, as I already said, the Global Innovation Index is not exactly the right outcome. The sustainability goals are great, but not exactly the right outcome. And I'm I've been working with a team of researchers on a different measure, a different point that countries and co companies, frankly, need to go after. And it's based on this idea from Macron who said, for society to be sustainable, you have to restore the equality of chances. And it's based on this. The idea is if every individual in society feels empowered and enabled and supported to self-actualize, to realize their full potential, that society necessarily will be a high-performing society. That society will necessarily win the race. And so the thing, I've been, then, sorry, the thing I've been talking about is this idea of the latitude index, which is a measure, it's a, it's a melding of a lot of the other measures in a way that really gets at the personal feeling of society relative to uh, ability to reach potential. And then the last thing I would say to you, um, and this is like a weird thing, I understand. Um, this isn't about them. This is about us. That if you want to change the way, it starts with changing your way. I think the bias of humans is to think it's somebody else's problem. You know, if we want to be responsible innovators, to use the gentleman's term before, that starts with us. You know, if we want to increase the chance of innovation and success, that starts with us. If we want to be better collaborators, that starts with us. If we want to be better understand the humans around us, that starts with us. And so as each of you goes forward today, I would just encourage you, don't go forward as government officials, don't go forward as technologists, don't go forward as fintech founders, investors, go forward as humanists. Go forward as people that care about people and understanding people in such a way that you significantly increase the chance of innovation success. With that, I thank you. I hope this was helpful. Thanks very much.